And Professor Clements with you as we consider sort of a wrap up to uh, electricity and magnetism where we find that there are electromagnetic waves, waves that are made up of electric fields and magnetic fields and some uh, interesting effects and uh, some differences from waves that we discussed in first semester. Again, uh, the material I'm talking about relates to the OpenStax College Physics Chapter 24, and we'll talk about just the first two sections of that chapter today. Uh, Maxwell's equations, some general things about light, and how uh, light is produced, how electromagnetic waves are produced. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, go into our slides here. We have visible light. Our eyes are, are electromagnetic wave detectors in the range of visible light. Then we have colors and uh, you know, detect motion and uh, the waves carry a lot of information to us. There are a different type of electromagnetic waves, the radio waves that uh, are used in astronomy and uh, entertainment industry. Your TV remote control has infrared uh, emitters. This image was made with a special camera that was sensitive to infrared wavelengths. Uh, but uh, there are infrared emitters, not dangerous, they're not lasers, but uh, a type of light. Microwave, another type of electromagnetic radiation. And x-rays, another type of electromagnetic radiation. So we'll discuss that in a little bit. But uh, we're now moving on into the later 1800s, in the 1860s, 1870, and the uh, physicist who really is predominant here in uh, helping the world, the world of science, understand light is James Clerk Maxwell in Scotland. And he came up with a uh, set of equations known as Maxwell's equations. He modified what was known earlier as uh, Ampere's Law. And these are you know, somewhat calculus uh, uh, based equations, but there are four equations that relate to electricity and magnetism. We've uh, discussed these in a little bit different forms. Um, the uh, uh, top equation up here uh, relates to uh, Coulomb's law. Here we have uh, the fact that there are no magnetic monopoles. And here we have the fact that a changing uh, magnetic field will create an EMF. And down here, we have a description of how current creates magnetic field. This is the uh, uh, equation that Maxwell modified and uh, enabled him then to predict the existence of these electromagnetic waves. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that uh, occurred here shortly. But uh, moving beyond the early 1800s now, in the study of electric and magnetism, Maxwell had Maxwell's equations that predicted the existence of these electromagnetic waves. So let's talk about how he modified Gauss's, or sorry, Ampere's law. Uh, we've studied how current creates magnetic field. Again, if you'd put your thumb of your right hand along this wire and wrap your fingers around the wire, we get a magnetic field that's a circle around the wire. And Ampere's law pr makes that prediction here. There is a little bit of trouble if we try to do this with the original Ampere's law between the plates of a capacitor. A uh, capacitor has an insulator between the two plates, so there is not this conventional current. Maxwell realized, however, that it would be very strange for us to predict magnetic field right here, but then here not have a magnetic field. And that is the case with the standard Ampere's law. So Maxwell modified this law to take into account an effective current called the displacement current. Uh, this electric field is going to be changing uh, between the plates of the capacitor. If there's current here, then there's charge being delivered to the capacitor. And the electric field changes value. So this is a changing electric flux. Uh, previously, we studied how a changing magnetic flux creates 
the EMF, an electric field, a changing electric field creates magnetic field. So uh, the displacement current was a big modification to the laws of electricity and magnetism made by Maxwell, but enabled him to combine these uh, equations over here, these four equations, by merging them together there's a prediction that there is an electromagnetic wave, a, a wave made of electric field and magnetic field that propagates through space and he could predict the, uh, the speed of this wave um, and it came out to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's the mathematical prediction and that matches the measurement of the speed of light. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that was uh, confirmation that Maxwell was uh, on the right track. One thing that was not understood at the time was that light does not need a medium to travel from one place to another. So light is a wave. We have water waves. They need a water for a medium. We have waves on a rope that needs a rope. We have sound waves. The sound needs air or a solid or liquid, but something for the vibrations to, uh, uh, to pass from the uh, source to the receiver. And light is different. Um, it was proposed that there was something called the luminiferous ether, a medium for light to travel through. And experiments were done to try to detect this uh, luminiferous ether. They failed. There is no medium required for light. Electricity and magnetism, the electromagnetic wave, is different than other waves that we've studied. The electromagnetic wave does not need a medium to travel from one place to another. Um, so let's talk about the electromagnetic wave here. So here's a representation of it. And we have you know, an electric field that is uh, up and down in this sketch. So get your three-dimensional glasses on. And magnetic field going side to side here, wavering back and forth. But the changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field. The changing magnetic field creates a changing electric field. And this wave propagates through space in this direction labeled Z here. The wave has a wavelength, just as we studied first semester, from peak to peak or valley to valley would be the wavelength. And uh, we can again do our calculations that uh, the wave velocity equals frequency times wavelength. There's some other interesting uh, uh, discussion in the textbook about Maxwell's equations and uh, Gauss's law for electricity, Gauss's law for magnetism, Ampere's law, Faraday's law. Um, you should read that, but the main concept is that Maxwell modified one of the laws of electricity and magnetism, he modified Ampere's law that uh, describes how magnetic field can be produced um, to include this current between the plates of a capacitor. And in do so doing, he came up with a set of mathematical relationships that could be combined to predict the speed of the wave. The speed of the wave is actually equal to 1 divided by the square root of epsilon naught and mu naught. We talked about epsilon naught a little bit when we studied static electricity. We talked about mu naught when we studied magnetism. So you might want to put those equations, or put those constants into your calculator. Multiply mu naught by epsilon naught. Take a square root, divide that into 1, and you'll find you get 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Another representation here of the electromagnetic wave. Um, uh, the, let's say the electric field is the red, the blue is the magnetic field, and we have the velocity of the wave in this direction. The electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Both fields are perpendicular to the velocity, is the construction of the electromagnetic wave. Um, so let's go just a little bit further here. The speed of light and some of the history on how it was measured. So the sun, the earth and its orbit around the sun, and not to scale, but out here further is Jupiter. Jupiter has four bright satellites, the Galilean satellites, 
that are easily observable with the telescope. In 1676, an astronomer by the name of Romer uh, reported observations he had made of the timing of the disappearance of the one of the, you know, of the satellites of Jupiter into the shadow of Jupiter and then the time they reemerge. The satellites around Jupiter are like a clock. Their orbits are very regular and Romer studied those uh, times of disappearing and appearing and found that there was a drift in the time they disappeared and reappeared. That drift was based on where the Earth was in its orbit. So if we would observe here at position H, and then we keep on observing, you know, theoretically till the Earth is at position E, what is found is that the uh, times of disappearance and reappearance drift getting later and later until we're delayed by about 16 minutes at position E compared to position H. Why would there be a time delay for the observation of where the uh, satellite goes into the shadow? And then as we come back on this side for the Earth going around back to position H, the eclipses get back in, uh, in time, in, in their proper uh, uh, ordering on the clock, uh, back to where they should be. So we have a delay in observing the eclipse when the Earth is on the far side of the Sun. And here at H, we're calling that the uh, uh, sort of reference position, we have the eclipses occurring as we think they should, time-wise. Well, light does not travel infinitely fast. And the Earth's orbit is large enough that there's an observation of a time delay of roughly 16 minutes. So Romer could come up with a rough value for the speed of light. There was a rough knowledge of the size of the Earth's orbit, not completely accurate. And he got, I think it's something like 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second for the, uh, for the speed of light. Um, equipment was improved by 1850. There were very accurate measurements of the speed of light. And the uh, technique here relies on using some light source, you know, perhaps a beam of sunlight, let it reflect off of a mirror onto another mirror and it's actually a long distance away, 10 miles, 15 miles um, would be the, um, the path here. When it, the light gets to this mirror, then it reflects back to our mirror here that happens to be a rotating mirror. In the time it takes the light to go out and come back, this rotating mirror will have turned by an angle of theta. We'll study, when we study mirrors, that this causes a shift of 2 theta out here for the reflected beam. Not to worry about that, just uh, the basic concept here is that we can measure the deflection from the angle where the light came in to the angle that the uh, reflected beam that's traveled a great distance um, bounces off of this rotating mirror. This gives us a time measurement. If we know the speed of the rotating mirror, we can relate this to some small fraction of uh, a second. And knowing the distance that the light has traveled divided by the time, we could get the speed of light. And again, the measured around 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that was uh, you know, confirmation that Maxwell was correct. His mathematical equation predicts 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And we're seeing a measurement of the speed of light of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Um, I'll go back just a little bit here. The uh, nature of the, of the wave, we have this wavelength, and there's also a certain frequency. How many uh, peaks per second would pass an observer, um, let's say out here, how many peaks per second would pass this observer? That would be the frequency of the wave. If we multiply frequency by wavelength, we get the wave velocity. It's the same equation we used in the first semester. Frequency multiplied by wavelength equals the velocity of the wave. In this chapter, we'll use the letter C to stand for the speed of light, small c. So C equals frequency times wavelength. And you can uh, do this calculation for your favorite radio station. Um, 
if you're on the AM band, then you're listening to a kilohertz uh, signal. So 1040 kilohertz would be 1040 times 10 to the third hertz for the frequency. Divide that into 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and you can find the wavelength of that AM radio station. If you're listening to the FM band, then it's a megahertz uh, frequency, so use a 10 to the six for the uh, for the number there. So if you're listening to 100.7 uh, megahertz, that'd be 100.7 times 10 to the six hertz that you would divide into three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and you'd get the wavelength for that, uh, that radio station. Um, so that's where uh, I'm gonna pause now for uh, our discussion here. But Maxwell modified the equations um, of electricity and magnetism, came up with a prediction there was this electromagnetic wave. It's a wave that consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. The oscillating electric field creates the magnetic field. The oscillating magnetic field creates the electric field. And this wave propagates through space. So uh, this has uh, been verified. Uh, a physicist by the name of Hertz, you know, 1887, a um, little bit of electric circuit going on here, create a high voltage. A spark occurs here. That spark generates an electromagnetic wave. So this would be a transmitter across the room. Hertz had a coil of wire and a tuner and could detect energy arriving at this antenna uh, from the spark that occurred over here. So the way the energy gets from point A to point B, the electromagnetic wave. So that was confirmation. And there's some, some studies that can be done that show it's a wave that's traveling with the polarization. Um, but a little bit too technical for us right now, just that uh, Hertz was able to use the spark transmitter and a receiver to show that energy could be transmitted across a room uh, by this electromagnetic wave. Um, so we're going to stop uh, just at that point and uh, break this into a couple sessions. Um, our beginning, our study of light, sort of a transition chapter to get into the study of optics.